Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the final lecture on forces and stresses for the geodynamics course. Here we're going to talk about stresses in 3D, and we have only one goal for this lecture, and that is to present stresses in 3D. And then there's kind of a cluster of terminology I'll present at the end that are common ways to refer to various types of stresses or various things uh, derived from the full three-dimensional stress. We've seen a picture like this already in one of the earlier lectures. Here we're looking at stress in three dimensions. And in this case, we had previously seen a similar figure showing forces in two dimensions. Here we have stress in three dimensions. So you'll notice these are only sigma y, y on the top surface and sigma x, x on this right side surface. In this case, though, we also have now the forces acting on the front and back surfaces. So that's the sigma zz and the sigma zx, sigma zy terms acting on the front and back faces. So those are the uh, stresses now acting on all of the faces of this cube. Again, the cube has the same dimensions we had before, delta x, delta y by delta z. We have three normal stresses sigma xx, sigma yy, and sigma zz. And you'll notice on all the faces, in addition to having one normal stress, there are now two shear stresses because we can, of course, have shearing either parallel to uh, one side of the face or parallel to the other side of the face along that surface. So here, then, we have a list of six shear stresses, sigma xx, x, or yx, x, z, z, x, y, z, and z, y. As we did previously at equilibrium, we can assume that some of these values are equal to one another, such as sigma x, y being equal to sigma y, x. So that means if you want to describe the stress of some object completely in three dimensions, you need to only know six values, the three normal stresses, and the three shear stresses, because again, we can assume at equilibrium that some of these values are equal to one another. As we had done previously in two dimensions, we can also determine the principal stresses in three dimensions here. We'll bypass doing the actual math of calculating those, but uh, I will make a note that the convention used for principal stresses is what's shown here. And that is that sigma 1 is greater than or equal to sigma 2, which is greater than or equal to sigma 3. So all three can be equal to one another. If one of them is larger, that's going to be denoted as sigma 1, and the smallest then would be denoted as sigma 3. As I mentioned, there are several of these different terms we'll use for describing stress. The first one is isotropic stress. So... Um, you might have heard the isotropic term previously in, for instance, a mineralogy course or something like that. Isotropic stress refers to the condition where sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, the three principal stresses, are all equal to one another. And in that condition, they would then also be equal to P, which is the pressure or mean stress. Um, so another state we might consider here is hydrostatic state of stress. That occurs when the normal stresses equal P and there are no shear stresses. So that would actually be the same as this case up here because you'll remember that in the case where we've calculated the three principal stresses there are no shear stresses and here we can see that they're equal to the pressure or mean stress. The reason I keep saying mean stress is the average stress. It would be sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 divided by 3. If all three of these are equal, then they're also equal to P, or the pressure. Lithostatic stress, now, is the same thing as the hydrostatic state of stress where the increase in stress is proportional to the density of the overlying rock. So when you talk about lithostatic stress, this is sometimes done um, in 
the fields of metamorphic petrology or structural geology. Uh, we'll talk about lithostatic stress, basically trying to figure out what the stress is at some depth in the earth under the assumption that we're not worried about any kind of additional stresses coming from the sides. It's simply the stress of the overlying uh, pile of rock at whatever depth. So that's our lithostatic stress. These three, um, isotropic stress, hydrostatic stress, state of stress, and lithostatic stress, I just put them on here because uh, the terms are sometimes confusing. Here you can see what I was talking about previously. Uh, in the case where we have pressure P um, and the principal stresses are not equal, then we could say P is equal to one third times sigma one plus sigma two plus sigma three. That's actually the same thing as just saying it's equal to the average of the principal stresses, right? Because you would just add those three up and divide by three. That would give you the pressure or mean stress, uh, the average stress. The same thing you can do for sigma xx, sigma yy, and sigma zz um, to calculate what the pressure is. All right, so there's one last thing we're going to talk about in this lecture, and that is the deviatoric stress. And it's something of a term that can get confused sometimes with things like differential stresses, which we'll see later on in the course. But deviatoric stress is simply the stress that you calculate when you subtract pressure from the three normal stresses. So if you take sigma xx minus p, sigma yy minus p, and sigma zz minus p, that will give you the deviatoric stress. Oftentimes, you'll see deviatoric stress indicated with a sigma prime xx, sigma prime yy. That tells you that you have already subtracted the pressure from the three normal stresses. What you can also notice here is that there's no change uh, to the shear stresses. This is something that's only going to modify the normal stresses. You can do exactly the same thing for principal stresses. You could say that sigma 1 prime, the deviatoric principal stress, uh, largest deviatoric principal stress, would simply be sigma 1 minus P, or the mean stress. Now, here is probably something of a, a little bit of a tricky exercise, something uh, that's maybe a little bit of a challenge to calculate, but I'll ask you the question, uh, what is the average of the deviatoric principal stresses? So if you took the average value of these three, uh, what do you get? And I'll give you a moment, you can pause the video. If you wanna go back, you might uh, benefit from taking a look at the previous slide, but let's see what you come up with for the average of the deviatoric principal stresses. Okay, hopefully when you have gone through and you've added sigma one minus p plus sigma two minus p plus sigma three minus three p and divided by three like you would for uh, averaging the deviatoric principal stresses, what you'd find is that those come to zero, that the average of the three is zero. And if you're curious, we can do this in class uh, the next time we meet. One of the reasons that deviatoric stresses are actually kind of useful to think about is that when rocks are behaving viscously for rock that's at depth in the earth, um, where it's deforming by viscous flow, all of the deformation that happens in that kind of rock is the result of non-zero deviatoric stresses. So there are some parts of the more shallow parts of the earth where uh, materials don't flow viscously, where rocks don't flow viscously, and um, there the shear stress is going to be important, but when you're talking about viscous rocks, it's only the deviatoric stress, the non-zero deviatoric stress that uh, will result in rock deformation. Okay, so that's the end of the fourth mini lecture on forces and stresses. I know that this topic can be a little bit dry, and it can also be a little bit of a challenge just to kind of get all the different names and symbols and stuff sorted out in your head. But this is kind of a foundation 
for what we're going to do later on in the course. So we're going to talk about rock rheology, and so we're going to have to use stresses when we do that. We're going to talk about a variety of other topics, bending of the lithosphere, and other things where the stress will be kind of fundamental. So a lot of things we'll do later on in the course will involve these different calculations and these different terms that you've learned in the last four mini lectures. As always, now's the time to take a shot at the quiz and we'll be playing around with some of this stuff in the exercises in class the next time we meet.